everything in the creation is already an indication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that it exists in the creation is already a proof for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the one who reflects and the one who ponders that. Uh, therefore, we don't need any any evidence. But we're living in a time, obviously, where there's this onslaught of secularism and atheism and uh, doubts are rising, especially in the uh, societies that we live in. Therefore, it's necessary for us to discuss some of the proofs of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, I've got share screen good. So we'll just take a look at um, something that I prepared regarding this issue. And the first thing I you know, wanted to mention is this uh, narration, very profound narration from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is which is sound, where he says there will be tribulations. Fitan, in which a man will be a believer in the morning. In the morning, he'll be a Muslim believer, la ilaha illallah. And by the evening, the person will have left the fold of Islam. The person becomes a disbeliever. Okay, and look what the Messenger of Allah says in this narration. There are different, some slight versions of it, but in this narration, the Messenger of Allah says, except to the one to whom Allah gives life to with knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given that person knowledge and given them life and iman. They won't be affected by these, these tribulations. Okay. And then Imam al Nawi said about this narration, in this commentary on Sahih Muslim, that because of the severity of those tribulations, the person will flip in one day because of that manner. When I was study, studying in, in Syria and the uprising in Syria actually began, I was, I was there at the time, the uh, uprising started in Syria. Uh, there were people who literally, you know, said, I, you know, I don't believe anymore. I'm not Muslim anymore. Arabs, Arabs, Muslims, uh, ignorant, but you know, because of this, you know, stress and severity, they uh, maybe said a statement of kufr or left the fold of Islam because of it. You know, so we're seeing that the uh, tribulations in terms of security and tribulations in terms of this onslaught towards uh, religious beliefs and religious people. And, you know, ultimately we don't have any guarantee as well that we will die upon Iman. None of us has been given that guarantee. We say we might be Muslim now, say la ilaha illallah now. But we don't have have been given any guarantee that that's how we'll die, and we don't have any guarantee that we will enter Jannah. In the Message of Allah, alayhi salatu salam, in another narration uh, <coughs> transmitted by Abdullah bin Masood and Abu Huraira and others, he mentions that I swear by the one who there is none worthy of worship except Him that some one of you will act like the people of Jannah. So, so a person will do the actions of the people of Jannah. He'll, he'll outwardly it will appear like he deserves to enter Jannah. And until there is nothing between him and Jannah, except a cubit, the cubit is an arm span. This is, it, this is you know, an elusive statement to mean that he's close to entering Jannah. And then the message of Allah said, destiny will overcome. And this person will start to act like one of the people of the hellfire and he will enter the hellfire. And then he says another person will act like the people of the hellfire and until there's nothing between him and the hellfire apart from the distance of a cubit, but destiny will overtake him and he'll start to act like the people of Paradise, and you will enter paradise. You know, some of the people we, you know, see around us that are disbelievers now, they may die upon 
Islam and Iman and enter into Jannah. Ultimately, we don't know. And some of the people we see as Muslims now, they may die upon disbelief and enter the hellfire in the hereafter. These are the times that we are we're living in. Okay, this tri- this uh, version is in Ibn Majah that has the addition, except the one to whom Allah gives life to with knowledge. Okay, and that's why seeking knowledge is so important upon every Muslim in this day and age we're living in. Not a uh, secular knowledge, of course. The Messenger of Allah is not speaking about secular knowledge. He's speaking about religious knowledge here. And what is faith? Before, before we you know, discuss the existence of God, uh, maybe it's good for us to look at what do we mean by Iman or Islam? From our perspective, from the perspective of Islam, the religion of Islam, okay? And the theologians of Islam, um, you know, we've thought about this very carefully. And this is a summary of what they, they came up with. This is the definition of Iman. What does it mean to be a Muslim, basically? Okay, what does it mean to be a believer in Islam? So that's what we're concerned with, not the word faith in, in general. So Iman is belief in the heart. There are two aspects of it, the scholars of Islam have mentioned. One of them is belief in the heart or the mind, if you want. The heart is, um, you know, a, a metaphorical uh, usage of the mind, if you want, or the uh, the spirit. We use it in English as well. So it's having belief, inner belief, if you want. It's internal belief and outward affirmation. Okay? There's internal belief and outward affirmation. If in everything that the Prophet Muhammad came with. Okay? So it's... It, the inner belief and then the outward affirmation of that, that everything that the Prophet Muhammad came with is true and compliance with it as well, that you're content with it and you're happy to comply with it as well. I don't mean by compliance that carrying out all of the commands of Islam, just that the person accepts, you know, uh, that this is, yes, a part of Islam that, for example, eating pork yes i agree that it is prohibited whether they eat it or not that's a different issue but as long as a person is happy to say yes this is prohibited drinking wine is prohibited fasting in ramadan is an obligation <coughs> upon those muslims who are able to in performing hajj and so on we compliant with that that's what i mean by com- compliant with it that they agree that that is true and uh, the person who has no belief in the heart but outwardly affirms Islam, what do we call that person? What category does that person come under? Any anybody uh, any answers? Somebody you know, outwardly is affirming Islam, but inwardly no belief. A munafiq. What's a munafiq? What does munafiq mean? The hypocrite. The hypocrite. Okay. So there are people like that as well in in this country. I mean, they are Muslim community as well. They have absolutely no belief in Islam. I, but outwardly, they're professing to be Muslims and causing damage to the belief of, of Muslims as well. And the person who rejects belief in the the heart and doesn't confirm it outwardly that's what we call a disbeliever or a kafir it's an unbeliever somebody who doesn't believe in islam okay so we have to have both of those those things hanzala 
Al-Usaidi, one of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to write the Qur'an. He was one of the scribes of the Messenger of Allah. And one day he says that I met Abu Bakr, best friend of the Messenger of Allah. And Abu Bakr says, how are you, Hanzala? He says, Nafaqa Hanzala. He said, Hanzala has become a hypocrite. Hanzala is a munafiq. <laughs> and, you know, Abu Bakr says, what are you saying? He says, A'udhu Billah. He says, you know, subhanallah, what are you saying? And Hanzala explains to Abu Bakr, and he says that when we're in the company of the Messenger of Allah, and he speaks about heaven and hell, and reminds us, it's as if we're seeing heaven and hell with our very eyes. But when we go back to our wives and our children and our businesses, you know, we forget most of that stuff. And Abu Bakr, he says, he says, I swear by Allah, I experience a similar thing as well. So Abu Bakr, he goes to the Messenger of Allah and he says, he asks him, he says, you know, he says, Hans Allah has become a hypocrite. And the Messenger of Allah says, what are you, you know, what's going on? What's happened? And Hans Allah, he says, oh, Messenger of Allah, when we're with you, you remind us of heaven and hell. And, you know, it's as if we are, we are seeing it in, in front of us. And when we go back to our families and our businesses and our children and our wives, we forget most of it. And the Messenger of Allah said, I swear by the one whose hand my soul is in. He says, if you re were to remain this, as you were in my presence and remain in the remembrance of Allah, then you will shake hands with the angels in your beds and in your streets. He's, uh, you, would, you, you know, you'd, all of the unseen will become unveiled to you if you were to remain like that 24 7 it's not possible and he says sa'atan sa'atan ya hanzala and he said that three times sa'atan sa'atan what does that mean a time for worship and a time for remembering heaven and hell and a time for your worldly affairs there needs to be a balance you, you can't you can't sustain by such a spiritual level the prophets and the messengers, they can sustain such a spiritual level. They're always in that remembrance. Okay, this this they're asleep, but their hearts are awake. Okay, the, the unseen is unveiled to them. So the prophets and messengers, yes, I go for everybody else. It's not, it's not a possibility that they can remain in such a, such a state. So here I've. Uh, you know listed the three main causes of disbelief so when we look, look at disbelief before we look at these things why do people reject belief in Allah why do people leave Islam why do people what are the causes of disbelief and I've narrowed it down to three main causes in my view uh, this is something that I've just uh, thought of myself actually and compiled my, myself Oops, sorry, did I mute myself by mistake? Yeah, sorry. Oh, did you mute me, Mahmoud? <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> so this is something that I've compiled myself and thought of myself and pondered on that myself. And, uh, I've narrowed it down to these three areas. So one is a lack of, it might be a lack of intellectual conviction. A person is not convinced that God exists or convinced that Islam is the true religion. So the evidence that they, you know, and everybody needs evidence. We shouldn't expect people to believe without seeing evidence first, uh, especially in, in the time and age we, and place that we're living in as well. So a person might not be convinced by the evidence and presented to them. 
or they might not be bothered to to examine the evidence in the first place. Uh, you know, it might be the behaviour of Muslims is so bad that why would I even bother looking into Islam? You know, because whenever I meet a Muslim, you know, they're the worst of individuals. Why, why would I even bother about Islam? And, you know, we hear about all these uh, acts of terror that they do as well. They might have misunderstood the evidence as well. Okay. So first one is a lack of intellectual conviction. Second one is a lack of spiritual experience. I believe, you know, the spiritual experience is uh, stronger, to be honest with you. So having a spiritual experience and that can lead to very, very strong conviction. Okay. <clears throat> A person might have that experience or something spiritual happens to them, but they may try to explain that via the natural world from a materialistic viewpoint. But that, that is a very powerful, just like, you know, there are different levels of certainty. So it's a difference between somebody telling you, somebody comes and tells you that house over there is on fire. And then another person comes and says the house in such a place is on fire and then you know more people tell you you become fairly convinced you know there's a house on fire and but if you see if you're stood in front of that house that's burning down you see it with your own eyes you smell the smoke you might be inside the house that's a higher level of of conviction okay so you you're having that experience and witnessing the, the unseen realm. Okay. So that can be very, very powerful. And, you know, sometimes it's arrogance. Sometimes people, they know the truth. They're intellectually convinced. They might see miracles happen in front of them. They might witness the unseen. I got due to arrogance. And this is what they call kufru juhud. So they, they reject belief or they reject islam due to arrogance and arrogance i've said it's due to fear because you know a lot of the time it's uh out of fear of losing some type of material loss or some status or wealth or i don't want to be seen as a part of a group that is inferior or you know radically different uh so it stems from fear but it manifests itself as a type of uh, arrogance and we know this is true because of the story of who iblis which is in the quran okay iblis had uh, reached a level where he was considered to be one of the angels okay he was considered to be from the group of the angels and he would iblis he would worship allah you know some of the scholars that say there's not a place on the earth that Iblis didn't worship Allah. So he worshipped Allah. He knew about the angels. He knew about the creation of Adam and Eve and Jannah and hell. He knew about all of that. All of the unseen realities. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him to do one thing. They prostrate to, to Adam. Prostrate to Adam. That was, that was it. He couldn't do it. His arrogance wouldn't let him do it. He says, Ana khayrun minhum khalaqtahu, khalaqtani minaw, khalaqtahu min teen. I'm better than him. You created me from fire. You created him from, from mud, from clay. I'm better than him. So that arrogance. So Allah says, what? Aba wa stakbara wa kana min al kafirin. He refused. And he became arrogant. And because of that, he became of the disbelievers. It was because of his arrogance, not because of, you know, he had some incorrect aqidah or incorrect belief about heaven or hell or whatever, or he rejected any of that. I just, be, I because he refused to do that. Like Abu Jahl, even Abu Jahl, you know, the great enemy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His nephew, Al-Miswar, bin Makhrama, uh, he asked Abu Jahl, about the Prophet Muhammad 
and he says, you know, oh, oh uncle, you know, did you ever accuse Muhammad of lying before, you know, he said what he's claiming now. And Abu Jahli says, you know, my nephew, yeah, I swear by Allah, since Muhammad has lived with us, we, since a young child, we've always called him al Amin, the trustworthy one. That was his nickname. We always know him to be trustworthy. Sadiq, the truthful, okay? And the Miswa says, you know, why, what's the problem now then? Why, why don't you follow him, him now? And Abu Jahali says that, he says, we, meaning Beni Abdul Shams, Abu Jahal is from the tribe of Abdul Shams, the prophet is from the tribe of Beni Hashim. Okay, and Beni Hashim, they had control of the Kaaba and the Hajj and looking after the pilgrims, and which is a big thing amongst the Quraysh. He says, Well, you know, our tribe and Beni Hashim, we've always competed with one another. They used to feed the poor, we used to feed the poor. They supplied, supplied the pilgrims with water. We did it as well. They used to give a refuge to uh, refugees. We did it as well. And he says we were equal, just like two horses in a race. And then he said a prophet. They did you know, they said, sorry, he, Abu Jah, he says, he said, they said a prophet, we've got a prophet. Now prophet has appeared amongst us. And he says, we can't achieve something like this okay so arrogance sometimes is is a barrier uh due to fear just like abu talib as well the uncle of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet asked him to profess islam and this abu talib wasn't somebody who was antagonistic towards the message of allah or muslims quite the opposite actually but when the messenger asked him to testify to faith on his, on his deathbed he says you know i'm on the religion of my forefathers okay so that fear of uh, status uh, and being labeled as somebody who's abandoned the religion of the forefathers was too much even though you know he definitely must have known that the prophet muhammad was a true prophet so do, does God exist? Okay. Does it exist? Inshallah, I'll speak about, if I have time, uh, three different arguments for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so some of, some of these arguments have been mentioned by Islamic theologians. Um, but the, these arguments, they have been formulated by a uh, Christian professor actually named Dr. William Lane Craig. Um, he, he, you know, he, he actually uses some of the Islamic uh, arguments as well to support his uh, theories. And you can go to his website, it's reasonablefaith.org. There's, there's some Christianity on there, but you don't need to pay any attention to that. All we're concerned is these arguments for the existence of God. So he's a very famous uh, Christian apolog uh, apologist who uh, has proposed a number of very, very good arguments, logical, rational arguments, very, very solid as well, ironclad arguments for the existence of God. <laughs> and, you know, the, f the first one is what he calls the Kalam cosmological argument. Okay, maybe some of you have come across it already. Kalam is from, is an Arabic word, of course, which means speech. Okay, and one of the names for the science of Aqidah, particularly a certain branch of the science of doctrine in Islam, uh, it's a speculative branch. We call that Kalam speech and there are a number of reasons for that that i won't go into so he has uh compiled this argument and he's given you know all respect to him all props due to him he actually uses the word kalam as an indication that this is from those muslim philosophers and it's based on you know very simple premises and you know with each one of these premises 
uh, if we say that yes, the premise is true, then the conclusion has to be true as well. Okay, and the first premise is that everything that begins to exist has a cause. Okay, note here, the wording is very, very specific. We're not saying that everything that exists has a cause, because Allah exists, but we don't say Allah has a cause. We're saying that everything that begins to exist has a, has a cause. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> and the second premise is that the universe began to exist. Okay, is that true or not? Did the universe begin to exist or not? If so, then what conclusion do we get out of this? Does anybody know? Anybody come across this before? What's the conclusion? There's a cause for the universe. Has anybody in the audience come across this before? Can, you can unmute yourself if, if you want, it's no problem. No, the conclusion, that's a, you know, a, a conclusion further on down the line, there must be a creator. Um, anybody come across this before? No? So the the conclusion is that, therefore, the universe has a cause. The universe has a cause. Okay, and if we say, if we agree that the universe has a cause, then we can start speaking about what kind of qualities, what kind of properties and attributes can such a, does such a cause of the universe have? It has to be uncreated itself. It can't have a cause. It has to be beginningless has to be endless it has to be timeless spaceless infinitely powerful okay it has to you know be infinitely knowledgeable okay and so on it has to have all it has to be immutable it has to have all of those properties okay and that's what we call allah or, or god so i'm just want, i'm just going to show you a, a series a short video that which will explain it more. If you go to, just one second, let me uh, get this up. Let's see if we can share this now. If you go to uh, reasonable faith, no, it's not the, not the conting uh, contingency argument. Um, if you go to reasonable faith on uh, YouTube, you'll find all of these uh, clips that you can you can watch. Uh, so I'll just share. Just let me know if you can hear the sound or not. <laughs> exist or is the material universe all that is or ever was or ever will be one approach to answering this question is the cosmological argument it goes like this whatever begins to exist has a cause the universe began to exist therefore the universe has a cause is the first premise true let's consider believing that something can pop into existence without a cause is more of a stretch than believing in magic. At least with magic, you've got a hat and a magician. And if something can come into being from nothing, then why don't we see this happening all the time? No, everyday experience and scientific evidence confirm our first premise. If something begins to exist, it must have a cause. But what about our second premise? Did the universe begin? Or has it always existed? Atheists have typically said that the universe has been here forever. The universe is just there 
And that's all. First, let's consider the second law of thermodynamics. It tells us the universe is slowly running out of usable energy. And that's the point. If the universe had been here forever, it would have run out of usable energy by now. The second law points us to a universe that has a definite beginning. This is further confirmed by a series of remarkable scientific discoveries. In 1915, Albert Einstein presented his general theory of relativity. This allowed us, for the first time, to talk meaningfully about the past history of the universe. Next, Alexander Friedman and George Lemaitre, each working with Einstein's equations, predicted that the universe is expanding. Then in 1929, Edwin Hubble measured the red shift in light from distant galaxies. This empirical evidence confirmed not only that the universe is expanding, but that it sprang into being from a single point in the finite past. It was a monumental discovery, almost beyond comprehension. However, not everyone is fond of a finite universe, so it wasn't long before alternative models popped into existence. But one by one, these models failed to stand the test of time. More recently, three leading cosmologists Arvind Bord, Alan Guth and Alexander Vilenkin prove that any universe which has on average been expanding throughout its history cannot be eternal in the past but must have an absolute beginning. This even applies to the multiverse, if there is such a thing. This means that scientists can no longer hide behind a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Any adequate model must have a beginning just like the standard model. It's quite plausible then that both premises of the argument are true. This means that the conclusion is also true. The universe has a cause. And since the universe can't cause itself, its cause must be beyond the space-time universe. It must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused and unimaginably powerful. Much like God. The cosmological argument shows that, in fact, it is quite reasonable to believe that God does exist. Okay. Oops. So we'll just go back back to this, take a look at this again. So it's, very, it's a very, very simple argument, actually, um, that you can memorize. And, you know, if you, you're discussing, talking to atheists, it's something that you can propose to them. And generally, you know, people, they'll, they, you know, they do accept these premises. So everything that begins to exist has a cause. We don't see you know, pink elephants just popping out of a thin air. Uh, we don't say, you know, a Boeing 777 airplane just popped out of, of nowhere and so on. Uh, the world around us, our natural physical world, hey, tells us that things they have to have a reason. And, we, you know, the, you know, first, one of the first things, you know, they study in philosophy is from nothing. Nothing comes one of the first principles. If there's nothing, then nothing will happen. Nothing comes out of nothing. So there has to be something to initiate that cause the, the, the universe coming into existence. And the universe began to exist. You know, that, you know, has been proved beyond doubt. And there's practically consensus in the uh, scientific, scientific community that that is the case. In the solid state model of the universe, which uh, you know proposes that the universe has always been there, has been been rejected, and you even get some, some uh, I think Dr. Marty Rees now he says that a bit. I don't believe I believe the universe began to exist, but I believe there was something before it as well. Maybe what is that thing? You know, they, they can't give an answer. So people generally will agree with the first two premises. 
you know, the outcome of that is the universe has to have a course. Now you might say, um, the universe created itself. Okay. Can something create itself? Does that make, make sense? Is that a logical statement? Can the, can the, can the universe create itself? Okay, it's like saying, uh, you know, somebody can give birth to themselves. It's, it's impossible, it doesn't make, logically, it's impossible for that to happen because it would have to exist before it, <laughs> it brings it, it, itself into existence. So logically, it, it doesn't work. So people generally agree on those two premises and the, the uh, conclusion of that as well. Another argument is uh, what we call a teleological argument. Um, but this is from the fine tuning aspect. Okay. So, teleological argument is just basically of what they call a design argument. Okay. The universe has a, has a designer. Um, there's a big movement as well in the scientific community. Um, to support the idea of intelligent design okay dr stephen meyer if you read his book signature in the cell and he's got uh you know darwin's doubt as well and other books that are coming out um he's done a lot of ex research and a uh, very lot of good work he's a christian a scientist uh dr stephen meyer but he's pushing for scientists to accept the idea of intelligent design and do you know uh, his you know book it deals with looking at this person's dna and the dna person's dna is a rich very very rich code more complex than the most complex uh, computing code that we we you know have ever seen and we know when there's code that means there has to be some something or someone who created that code it can't just appear you know by chance or you know haphazardly so the the uh, this argument looks at the actual beginning of the universe and the fine-tuning all of the constants that were in place at the time of the big bang uh, and the fine-tuning of them were all perfect for the universe to exist to permit intelligent life on earth as we as we know it okay so for example if the sun was just a mile closer to the earth you know nothing would exist if the force of gravity wasn't at the constant that it is then everything would collapse in the universe and nothing would exist as it is so this argument it says that fine-tuning of the universe if it's due to physical necessity meaning that those constants they have to exist in a per that, that particular manner Okay, or this universe, does it have to exist? No, no, it doesn't. Or by chance, could it be by chance? Is that a rational thing to believe? That all of this and every, that fine tuning and all the constants of the universe, it was just by chance or design. Okay, there's only three outcomes. Either it has to be like that, or it was a fluke, or it was designed to be so. Okay, and we will argue that it's not due to physical necessity or chance, which means what? The fine tuning of the universe is due to design. Okay, and every design needs a what? Needs a designer. Okay, and then we can start speaking about the qualities and properties of such a designer. So, again, we'll uh, just take a look at a video. Has anybody come across this argument before? Anybody in the audience come across this argument before? Again, we'll just take a look at a clip that explains it. From galaxies and stars down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. 
scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, a change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would, again, be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these, and many other numbers, have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. Wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. The remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. If anyone claims not to be surprised by the special features that the universe has, he is hiding his head in the sand. These special features are surprising and unlikely. What is the best explanation for this astounding phenomenon? There are three live options. The fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Which of these options is the most plausible? According to this alternative, the universe must be life-permitting. The precise values of these constants and quantities could not be otherwise. But is this plausible? Is a life-prohibiting universe impossible? Far from it. It's not only possible, it's far more likely than a life-permitting universe. The constants and quantities are not determined by the laws of nature. There's no reason or evidence suggests that fine-tuning is necessary. How about chance? Did we just get really, 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 really lucky? No. The probabilities involved are so ridiculously remote as to put the fine-tuning well beyond the reach of chance. So in an effort to keep this option alive, some have gone beyond empirical science and opted for a more speculative approach known as the multiverse. They imagine a universe generator that cranks out such a vast number of universes that odds are life-permitting universes will eventually pop out. However, there's no scientific evidence for the existence of this multiverse. It cannot be detected, observed, measured, or proved. And the universe generator itself would require an enormous amount of fine-tuning. Furthermore, small patches of order are far more probable than big ones. So the most probable observable universe would be a small one inhabited by a single, simple observer. But what we actually observe is the very thing that we should least expect, a vast, spectacularly complex, highly ordered universe inhabited by billions of other observers. So even if the multiverse existed, which is a moot point, it wouldn't do anything to explain the fine-tuning. Given the implausibility of physical necessity or chance, the best explanation for why the universe is fine-tuned for life may very well be it was designed that way.
A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. You know, that's the argument from from uh, fine tuning of the the universe. There is a general argument, you know, about about design as well that uh, we can use, which doesn't focus on that fine tuning of of the universe, uh, which is a very good argument as well. I think um, we wanted to leave about fifteen or twenty minutes at the end for questions, uh, Mahmoud. Or shall I carry on with the last argument? I don't know how, how, how does everybody feel? Should we open up yeah. the questions or? Yeah, I think we're all right. Time. Yeah, we're all right. Time. Is everybody okay? We need to go on to the last argument. Yep. Okay. No worries. So I'll just recap what we mentioned from this uh, argument for fine tuning. Yeah, everyone's okay. So premise number one, the fine tuning of the universe, it's either due to physical necessity, meaning it ha has to exist that way. And um, we don't know that's not the, the case. It's more likely that there would be a universe without life in it than uh, one with life. So we know it doesn't have to, be the way that it is or it was by chance it was the fluke you know all, all of those constants we've seen the numbers mind-boggling numbers you know there's, there's probably more chance of getting you know a team of monkeys in a room with typewriters and getting them to write you know uh beethoven's <laughs> love symphony there's more chance of that happening than you know the fine tuning of the universe occurring by chance or it was by design okay and then we will argue that no it's not by physics no it's not by chance therefore it only leaves one other outcome and it was designed that way okay we will ask the atheist what properties does the designer of the universe have it has to be undesigned okay it has to be infinitely knowledgeable, powerful, okay, timeless, spaceless, and so on, which is obviously what we believe about Allah. The last argument is uh, what Dr. Craig he calls the moral argument, and here we're not we're not looking at um, moral epistemology we're looking at moral ontology and what we mean by that is we're not looking at epistemology where it deals with how we uh, those morals came about how certain morals and values came about and how we, we you know we uh, decipher those morals and values we're just worried about the ontological reality of moral values and duties okay that the fact that they exist so you you know you might get atheists saying oh well it's you know these moral values and uh, obligations that we all agree upon they it's part of our conditioning or because our parents have taught us or evolution or whatever we're not it's not what the argument is dealing with whatsoever and it's only speaking about the ontological reality that these moral values and duties they exist okay and the first premise of the argument is that if god doesn't exist 
then objective moral values and duties, they also cannot exist. Okay, what I mean by objective moral values and duties are the, more, the obligation, moral obligations and values that we all agree upon. Uh, so for example, all humans, you know, will say that stealing is wrong you know, or that killing another human being is, is wrong. And so on, there are certain things, you know, we agree that child abuse and race, racism, those things we, you know, we objectively will say they are wrong. Okay. Somebody might have subjective values and duties uh, as well, which are related to the, you know, the person's own individual uh, preferences. But there are some things that we all humanity agrees that are just, they're just objectively wrong. <laughs> okay. And the second premise will state that objective moral values and duties, they do exist. They do exist, which, you know, means that God has to exist right? because God is the standard for those moral values and duties. Okay. So this, so this, this one is uh, maybe a bit more difficult to get your head around. So we we'll watch the last clip, uh, which discusses, let me get it up. The moral argument, inshallah. Okay. Can you be good without God? Let's find out. <laughs> Absolutely astounding. There you have it. Undeniable proof that you can be good without believing in God. But wait. The question isn't, can you be good without believing in God? The question is, can you be good without God? See, here's the problem. If there is no God, what basis remains for objective good or bad, right or wrong? If God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. And here's why. Without some objective reference point, we have no way of saying that something is really up or down. God's nature provides an objective reference point for moral values. It's the standard against which all actions and decisions are measured. But if there's no God, there's no objective reference point. All we are left with is one person's viewpoint which is no more valid than anyone else's viewpoint. This kind of morality is subjective, not objective. It's like a preference for strawberry ice cream. The preference is in the subject, not the object. So it doesn't apply to other people. In the same way, subjective morality applies only to the subject. It's not valid or binding for anyone else. So in a world without God, there can be no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. God has expressed his moral nature to us as commands. These provide the basis for moral duties. For example, God's essential attribute of love is expressed in his command to love your neighbor as yourself. This command provides a foundation upon which we can affirm the objective goodness of generosity, self-sacrifice, and equality. And we can condemn as objectively evil greed, abuse, and discrimination. This raises a problem. Is something good just because God wills it? Or does God will something because it is good? The answer is neither one. Rather, God wills something because He is good. God is the standard of moral values, just as a live musical performance is the standard for a high fidelity recording. Without your love, the more a recording sounds like the original, the better it is. Likewise, the more closely a moral action conforms to God's nature, the better it is. But if atheism is true, there is no ultimate standard. So there can be no moral obligations or duties. Who or what lays such duties upon us? No one. Remember, for the atheist, humans are just accidents of nature, highly evolved animals. But animals have no moral obligations to one another. When a cat kills a mouse, it hasn't done anything morally wrong. 
the cat's just being a cat. If God doesn't exist, we should view human behavior in the same way. No action should be considered morally right or wrong. But the problem is, good and bad, right and wrong, do exist. Just as our sense experience convinces us that the physical world is objectively real, oh. our moral experience convinces us that moral values are objectively real. Every time you say, hey, that's not fair, that's wrong, that's an injustice, you affirm your belief in the existence of objective morals. You're well aware that child abuse, racial discrimination, and terrorism are wrong for everybody, always. Is this just a personal preference or opinion? No. The man who says that it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. What all this amounts to then is a moral argument for the existence of God. If God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. But objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Atheism fails to provide a foundation for the moral reality every one of us experiences every day. In fact, the existence of objective morality points us directly to the existence of God. Okay, so we just recap. Uh, just recap that argument again. So the argument is if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist. And the second premise is they do exist. And the good thing about this one is that even atheists, uh, they, you know, they, they, they'll agree. You know, atheists will be outraged at certain things that, you know, happen in society that they see as morally, morally wrong. Uh, but if, and if they don't believe that objective moral values and duties exist, then they shouldn't be outraged at anything. Just like they wouldn't be outraged if you know a lion attacks a gazelle and and eats it. It's just part of nature. It's just carbon particles. They shouldn't be outraged at any wrong that happens. Right? But their, their nature, that fitra that Allah subhanahu wa taala has made us upon, uh, you know, it's something that we all have objective and we all agree upon and you know the the conclusion is that that god must exist because god is a standard for those moral values and duties <laughs>